Welcome to the Health Reflections podcast, a podcast dedicated to exploring the world of anti-cancer living and empowering you to take control of your health. I'm Finola, your host and guide on this transformative journey towards a vibrant and resilient life. Join me for solo episodes and conversations with wonderful guests. I am beyond excited that you're here, so let's dive in. Hello everyone, welcome to another episode of the Health Reflections podcast. Today I am very excited because I have a very special guest right here. Her name is Ria. She's a cancer researcher living in Hong Kong. So Ria, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, uh, my name is Ria. I'm from Hong Kong and I'm a third year PhD student and I'm really happy to be here on this podcast all the way joining from Hong Kong to Brussels. I'm so happy that we're finally doing this. I have yes. been following you on Instagram for so long. Thank you, thank you. Like I'm trying to follow so long. other people as well who, you know, are quite similar to me in my background, but yep. <laughs> Yeah, it's, um, I'm really trying to find like, you know, the PhD female mm -hmm. community on Instagram mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. you're so real, like you really share your journey, like yes. both the fun part, but also the hard part. And yes. I was like, oh, mostly the hard you. parts. <laughs> yeah. Mostly the hard parts. But yeah, it's, it's, I think it's fun to let people know, you know, this is what the reality is. It's not all fun and games. <laughs> Right, it's it's wonderful. I think one time you received, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think mm -hmm. one time you received hate for showing the hard part. Yes, I did. And it's still there. I mean, the, the video is still there and it has like 1.1 million views now and like 500 comments. Obviously, there will be a lot of people saying that, you know, why did you choose a PhD if you, you know, if you know you were going to get into this, why did you start with it? And I'm like, that doesn't, you know, that doesn't mean that I can't share what I'm feeling right now. And it, it is a very good message for people out there who think that PhD is all, you know, beautiful and glamorous. It's not like, it's so much hard work that you will eventually have a mental breakdown, honestly. Yeah. <laughs> so I think I, mean, I have to I'm, share it. Yeah. yeah, yeah, for sure. I yeah. also share the, this, this side. Mm -hmm. um, I'm also in the third year of mm -hmm. my PhD and mm -hmm. I have already had three burnouts. Yeah, I can so imagine. So yeah. it's, yeah, uh, yeah so it's, it's, it's really, it, really important. Exactly. I, I hardly know any PhD student who hasn't been stressed, like mentally and physically, who hasn't had a burnout once every month, honestly, because mm -hmm. like, I think the, the, firstly, like the lifestyle or the working style based in Hong Kong and China versus what it is mm -hmm. for PhD students in let's say Europe or other countries is so much different. Like I can already imagine if you're having a burnout, imagine like in Hong Kong, I think it's a it's a very toxic world, work culture in general. So I think the, the burnout is even worse in Hong Kong, honestly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And like, yeah, that's just how it is. And people just live with it and they don't talk about it. <laughs> yeah, I think it's really important that we bring more awareness mm -hmm. towards this um but going back to the fun part i think we will get back into yes, the mental we'll health issue in just a second <laughs> <Definitely>. <laughs> um, but just for our listeners and our viewers mm -hmm. on youtube to get to know you would you like to tell mm -hmm. your story about how you became mm -hmm. a scientist and mm -hmm. decided to do cancer research mm -hmm. sure so uh Basically, in Hong Kong, I went directly from a bachelor's in biomedical sciences to a PhD in biomedical sciences. So there was not really any, you know, master's degree joining me or integrating me from a bachelor's to PhD. So I think, yeah, that was that was one of the things that I didn't consider. But in general, I think I've always been very like enthusiastic about about being in a lab and for as long as I can remember, even in high school. In high school, you don't actually have that much exposure, right? You have more of like a biology, chemistry, physics exposure, but I wanted to be in the lab, honestly. I wanted to look under the microscope. It sounds, it sounds like very, you know, like very regular thing that people say, but it's, it's just what everyone feels who works in a lab. Like you like looking under a microscope and that is it. Like, <laughs> so uh, that's how it I is, got it into- really is. 
exactly like that's what everyone <laughs> feels there's there's no there's no shame about it so it just started with that and uh originally i i wanted to be you know a, a medical doctor honestly so i wanted to get into the mbbs uh, line but obviously my grades weren't that great enough so that's how i shifted towards research and i went from working in the epigenetics background like uh, cancer epigenetics or other types of work uh, in my undergrad and i gradually shifted to cancer biology in my phd so uh, obviously cancer biology is a very hot topic so that's how it grabbed my like attention as well and there were some good researchers in hong kong who were doing work around that area so i was like you know why not give it a try <laughs> yeah it's super nice. I felt so related when you mentioned the microscope. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exactly, <laughs> you know, yeah. um, my parents, they noticed at a very early age that I was mm -hmm. very into science. Mm -hmm. So one Christmas, they gave me as a present a microscope. That's so adorable, like a mini microscope, <laughs> right? <laughs> Well, it was not that small. Like you could actually, oh I mean, it was it's not a scientific yes, microscope. Yes, because that's expensive. Um, <laughs> it was, it was expensive, oh and, but you could really use it. You know, mm -hmm. it came yeah. with slides mm -hmm. and, you know, like small regions for you that's to like. That's cute. Yeah. I, I wish my parents <laughs> recognized that as well, but no, I mean, that's really nice of your parents. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it was, it was literally everything that I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. I just wanted mm -hmm. to be with a microscope. Still, and I remember yeah. that I had a curfew. Mm -hmm. So I would hide, um, I would hide under my bed <laughs> with a small, you know, like light, just mm -hmm. looking at my microscope for my parents not to see <laughs> that I was awake. <laughs> so yeah, that's like, yeah. I can, I can imagine, but that's very rare, honestly, for a child to have a microscope of its own. <laughs> I know. I just I just think my my parents just noticed. Mm -hmm. so I mean, it's nice like, that they okay. noticed in time. Yeah, like, that's what you're interested in. They were like, "We need to help this girl." Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's cool. Um, so I think you slightly answered um but maybe you want to talk more in detail mm -hmm. like did mm -hmm. you know all your life mm -hmm. that you wanted to do this or did something happen that mm -hmm. you were like okay this is what i'm going to do okay I, I think i get what you mean but like you know when um for many people uh when you're growing up you are you know generally just figuring out what you want to do in life you do have an idea you know like this is what i like doing this is what i'm not good at doing and this is what i definitely don't want to do <laughs> so uh for me like you know being in a very strict convent you know all girls school for most of my life it was more about being in the stem you know stem majoring and that was the only i think you know good part of being in that school because you know they really pushed you academically and i was like okay you know stem is where i want to be and i narrowed it down to biology eventually it wasn't really mathematics or physics or chemistry for me it was mostly biology but that's how like that's how i started thinking about it either to go in medicine or you know to go in life sciences biotech or research and eventually, you know, I think the deciding factor usually comes around when you're graduating from high school, entering into, you know, your bachelor's. That was one of the deciding factors for me, for sure, that I decided, you know, that my grades aren't that gra like great for medicine anyway. So I might as well go the, to the closest thing that is to medicine, which was biomedical sciences. And back then, obviously, my parents didn't really have that many resources to send me abroad. And uh, living in Hong Kong is already kind of very expensive. So, you know, I, I was just thinking, you know, I'll just, you know, maybe try to get into a university locally. And that's how I bumped into biomedical sciences. And eventually it just started from there. So um, the interesting thing is that when I got into biomedical sciences in my bachelor's, uh, I was thinking of getting into research, but the program was not designed in the way of research at all. And it was like... The advertising of the entire program was so different from what I imagined it to be. So I ended up, you know, studying like medical laboratory technician work for four years of my life. 
and during the meantime i was always just thinking about research so that is the one thing i definitely remember and uh i think medical laboratory technician work i don't know if you're very aware but it's like it's more of diagnostics and you know that's what technicians in hospitals do they're either you know working in uh, microbiology pa pathology uh stuff like that like he uh yep yeah, so that that kind of area but i wanted to to be more in the research side that that work side sounded very boring to me the diagnostic work so i think that's like one of the ways like you know your circumstances just shift you in where you want it to be and that's how i ended up in research in the first place eventually it was just a matter of who offers you you know the first opportunity and eventually there was like the professor in epigenetics who offered me the first you know my first opportunity to work in a research lab and that's how the journey basically started <laughs> so yeah it's it's all about being in those circumstances yeah i also i also experienced that um because mm -hmm. i always i always knew i wanted to do science Mm -hmm. um, but during my bachelor, that's when I mm -hmm. tried to pick up, you know, like the summer, um, yeah. it's not a job, but like you practice. You summer internship, yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And um, I tried uh, clinical analysis, I mm -hmm. tried microbiology, right. and this is going to sound really bad, but it was only fun when a patient was ill. You know what I mean? Because that's the only I, way I that I could learn. Know. You know, because right, right, it was right. what you said, diagnostics. We got yeah. samples from patients yes. getting exactly. checkups. So it was just like the procedure. You take the sample, mm -hmm. you put it in the machine, you run the machine, and then you take out, you print the yes. analysis, and you give it exactly. to the doctor. So exactly. I wasn't really learning anything. Anything, yep. yep. Rather than the protocol of the laboratory. Yeah. Um, it was only when a patient was ill mm -hmm. and then the chief of the laboratory sat mm -hmm. down with me and said, okay, mm -hmm. what can you see in these mm -hmm. lab results? What does this mean? What does this mm -hmm. other thing mean? So it was like, there's no way yep. I will yep, learn. Yeah, exactly. So exactly. that was my first yeah. clue for research mm -hmm. lab. Right. But that's interesting like you also realized right in time yeah. that this is not what you want to do and yeah mm -hmm. I, th I think it's good that you realized and moved on to what you actually wanted to do <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. exactly but like but like right so, now sorry like right now when you think about it uh do you think like it was a good choice to move, move from diagnostics to research like in that way well yeah because what i know now Mm -hmm. I would have never learned there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sure, yeah. Like today, I have developed my own experiments. Mm -hmm. Whilst there, it was all like a protocol. Yeah, yeah. With definitely. the machines, you know, and yeah. step one, step two, step three. And it was exactly, always yeah. the same. Yep. Depending on the test that the doctor was asking. Mm -hmm. But yep. here it's like, okay, I want to study this protein. Exactly. How can I? get to my goal and exactly. I'm the one developing the experiment and like everything right. after the experiment. Yeah, exactly. You were there to use your brain and you know come up exactly. with a solution. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I get it. Hopefully. <laughs> um so are there any mm -hmm. challenges that you mm -hmm. faced when you know studying your bachelor mm -hmm. and getting into your PhD? Mm -hmm. I think definitely like, you know, my bachelor's obviously, my bachelor's studies didn't align with my research goals, right? In the first place, it was like four years of diagnostics, learning, memorizing stuff that I know I won't be using in the future. And then, you know, it came to a point where um, I was like, okay, I want to stick with research, but you know, you have to figure out how you're going to, you know, give enough time, get, you know, enough learning out of it. And to be able to understand, you know, how a, a research lab works, it takes a lot of time and commitment. You can't just, you know, 
imagine that okay if you go there on summer internships you understand exactly what's going on in a research lab so for the first three years of you know being in summer internships in a research lab it was tough like it's not easy at all you're trying to figure out what they're talking about in research papers and it just goes over your mind and your brain and you have no mm -hmm. idea and i mean other than that uh, obviously you eventually progress and you realize you know how good you are at the end of the day in in what you're interested in so uh even though my grades weren't that great i think i think at the end what the phd you know uh, interviewer saw in me was okay this student is you know ready to commit herself to the next four years of studying and working and producing some you know results and i think yeah just getting through that was a little bit tough yeah Mm -hmm. I can imagine. Mm -hmm. I I also had lots of challenges, and mm -hmm. um, I can see what you say when you're mentioning um, the grades. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's a lot of pressure, mm -hmm. but also I think it's important that we start bringing awareness that the grades do not define mm -hmm. who you are. Yep, they or don't. your talent or mm -hmm. your potential mm -hmm. or how smart you are mm -hmm. um, because there's so many factors mm -hmm. when yep. you do an exam right like mm -hmm. you're stressed you yep. get nervous some mm -hmm. of us like me I I just I was in blank yep yep and I had I know been it, studying yep. so much and yep. so hard and then you know mm -hmm. I had the paper right in front of me and I was like oh, I don't know yep. You just go blank, exactly. Yeah, yeah but I do yeah. know. Exactly. And it's just in that moment, yeah. I, I think that's... I just think when you... Yeah. yeah. I, I just think in that moment, you kind of freeze. And not everyone is good at memorizing and, you know, reproducing that information in that amount of time. And I mean, on paper, you definitely need those grades to some extent. But at the end of the day, your skills, your knowledge, you know, how mm -hmm. you... Uh, show yourself and how you commit yourself mm -hmm. to what you're doing matters the most as well in interviews like I have personally seen it as well so um, I would I mean I always tell my friends as well <clears throat> or people you know who reach out to me for getting into PhD interviews and stuff and I, I always tell them you know grades are one thing but if you show yourself to be confident enough in what you're interested in that also equally matters actually much more so yeah absolutely I completely yeah. agree with you. Definitely, yeah. Right, so another thing that I think it's really important to bring awareness, mm -hmm. and I just have to ask you this, mm -hmm. as we're two women. Mm -hmm. How do you feel mm -hmm. as a woman working mm -hmm. in science? <laughs> Honestly, when... <laughs> okay, so many people have asked me this question, especially like in the last two podcasts <laughs> I've done. And... I mean, I wouldn't say mm -hmm. it's, I wouldn't say that it's bad, like, you know, I personally haven't experienced anything where I can say, oh my god, I felt discriminated or anything like that, because um, both or three of my supervisors so far have been pretty, like, you know, uh, like I would say, they've been pretty lenient in a way as well, they wouldn't, um, they wouldn't try to outcast me in any way, discriminate me in any way. But I mean, I do also have experienced uh, at times where I think that, you know, the same, uh, like my colleagues who are males working with me in my lab, uh, maybe my supervisor would assume that, you know, the males would just naturally be better at, let's say, uh, uh, dry lab work, which is that they might just be better at coding or, you know, uh, understanding data versus women might be better with you know doing experiments in the wet lab area so you know that general conception that okay you know women might be better at the wet lab work because they're good you know with their hands and how they manage the work and in in general like that i think obviously i've experienced that and i think it's a very big uh uh discrimination against i think both gender it's like a bias towards both gender which doesn't make any sense so um yeah, that's one of the things that I've definitely experienced back and forth. And uh, even right now, like, you know, you won't believe it, but like I'm the only female in my lab currently. And mm -hmm. our lab isn't that big. 
we don't have a lot of people we might have like one postdoc yeah one postdoc and uh, three to four PhD students and one technician and my supervisor they're all males I'm the only female currently right now <laughs> So uh, it's just generally expected that, you know, okay, females won't be that strong enough. So let's say if you have liquid nitrogen, you know, in, in, a, you know, in a biological lab, you need a lot of stuff to maintain the lab and everyone has their own duties. So mm -hmm. it's just generally expected that, you know, the men in the lab will be taking care of those duties and the women can do more, you know, easier duties in the lab. So, uh, that's, that's definitely one of the things I've experienced over the years of working in a research lab. <laughs> but I'm sure people in the corporate world, they experience much worse than what we do. So I'm happy <laughs> where we are. <laughs> yep. Can't complain a lot. <laughs> yeah, but that's, that's what I was going to say. I think yeah. it's a very good thing, your situation, mm -hmm. right? Because mm -hmm. I have heard other stories that are mm -hmm. horrible. Um, so yeah, I, I always like asking these questions mm -hmm. because it's not always the same and mm -hmm. I think it's a little bit bad that we assume mm -hmm. that it's always going to be bad for women in mm -hmm. science. Yes, I agree. Which I is, what you mean. It's just it's not always the case. Sadly, mm -hmm. it still happens, mm -hmm. but I think it's a good thing that it's slowly changing I, I believe so yeah but in, even in general I think uh, what I've tried to read online as well and what I've tried to come across and what I've seen as well is like even in my let's say you know department itself in, in biomedical sciences the number of female supervisors versus the male supervisors the number is completely you know like different so uh, what I mean is that you know in higher positions, even in academia, you'll find very little female supervisors as, compa as compared to male su supervisors. And I mean, yes, uh, I've tried discussing it with my friends as well, and they will always, you know, there will always be this one argument that, okay, you know, it may not be based on your gender, but more on your ability, you know, how good are, you know, you are at research. And over the years, you know, how you've established yourself as a researcher. If there's just chances that, you know, male supervisors or those males who are in those leading roles were more competent or, you know, more uh, deserving of that role as compared to the females. But then, you know, I actually did go online to read about, you know, their research papers on this, that even a name of a female researcher as the first author in any manuscript can be, dis you know, a discriminatory factor. Mm -hmm. And they're less likely, you know, females as first authors are much less likely uh, to be accepted, let's say, with their manuscript or, you know, they're more likely to be judged in the first place as compared to the male authors uh, in as a first author. So I, I had no idea about that. And it exists like, you know, it exists out there. Why do we have to doubt a female's capacity as a researcher, but not as a male's capacity? So uh, I've definitely like, experience some of that as well <laughs> yeah mm -hmm. yeah i mean in my situation mm -hmm. it, it, it got me thinking when you mentioned um about the supervisors because in my mm -hmm. lab there are way more uh male supervisors mm -hmm. like a lot more mm -hmm. but exactly. there are more female phd students okay interesting <laughs> So it's yeah. I I have yeah. no idea what you mean when yeah. when I. But I mean that's probably mm -hmm. because when I arrived both, it was like yeah. Sorry, I mean I I just thought that that might be the reason because we're both in like life sciences and biomedical sciences area. But if you go to engineering, mm -hmm. you'll see the opposite. <laughs> so like <laughs> let's say you go to electrical engineering, biomedical engineering departments, or mm -hmm. other engineering based departments, uh, there will definitely be more male PhD students than the females. <laughs> Yeah. It's yeah. I think it's really interesting depending on the um department that you that you go to. Mm -hmm. But exactly. yeah, I was really really happy when I arrived for the first time and I saw mm -hmm. so many females yeah. PhD students. <laughs> I was like, ah, yeah. Yep. I know, yeah. I know what you mean, yeah. Actually most of my friends as well, they're mostly female PhD students. It's just that in my lab specifically over the years many mm -hmm. students just graduated and it's an old lab it just turned out mm -hmm. to be that i'm the only female left right now 
and I don't know if there will be any future, you know, female PhD students, but I'm the only female energy they have in the lab right now. So I, I sometimes I feel like, you know, the my colleagues around me, they don't understand what I'm going through mentally because, mm -hmm. you know, considering like female hormones and what you go through personally, mentally and at work, you need a female colleague to also feel, you know, similar stuff to you. Yeah. And male colleagues just cannot, you know, relate to that. <laughs> yeah. No, they can't. They, they cannot. Um, yeah. <laughs> I remember one time I was having, um, yeah, a breakdown. And a, a colleague, like male, came to me and he said, you're way too emotional. <laughs> okay, that's just very... And like, mean. he's my friend, exactly, right? Yeah. Like, he's my friend. He yeah. was just genuinely trying mm -hmm. to help me mm -hmm. and make me stronger. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, two things here. First, I'm a woman. I don't deal with things the same way as you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And second, yes, I am extremely emotional yeah. person. And the fact that you accept <laughs> it, but then, yeah. Yeah, but like, but it's true. I'm yeah. very emotional. Mm -hmm. Like compared to other female friends, I am really, really super emotional. Mm -hmm. So sometimes I, I get it. Like, mm -hmm. but I, I, I sat down with him and I said, "You cannot approach me like this." Yep, yeah. yeah, I agree. Like, you're my friend, and mm -hmm. I love that you're trying to make me stronger. Mm -hmm. But for you to give me the right advice, mm -hmm. you need to understand. Mm -hmm. Why am, why am I reacting like this? Yeah, yeah. Or why is this affecting me mm -hmm. to such a level that I'm crying? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And when I said that, he was like, "Oh, but wait, well, what's happening?" Like, you know, that's the yeah. moment that he yeah. he got like actually bored. Yeah. And when I, you know, we talked very deep, mm -hmm. and now he's slowly when he sees my face, mm -hmm. he's like. You need space we're gonna create your space let's get you out of here mm -hmm. you can cry safely mm -hmm. do you yeah. want to talk do you want to hug <laughs> yeah. I, I mean that's that's really nice so, like you know at least they're trying to understand the situation yeah. You know? yeah he's slowly slowly learning because before he just had like you know the common sentences like ugh women what are you gonna do like yeah, yeah. no Exactly. But um, I'm very happy <laughs> that's really that he's nice, yeah. like really trying. <laughs> yes, exactly. I, I can I can understand what you mean here. I, I just think that everyone has their own way of dealing with emotions or mental breakdowns. And I have seen it with my friends as well, whether female or males. They'll have their own ways of dealing with their emotionals. I think at the end of the day, everyone is emotional. And you know, no matter how much we try, our work always interferes with our personal life. So I think our emotions just overwhelm us sometimes. Some people are just better at hiding those emotions and dealing with them separately. And I mean, yeah, I accepted that I am also very emotional at times and I just need to show that emotion like physically to be able to deal with it. You cannot suppress your emotions to let it just, you know, build it in a jar, especially not doing a PhD, like while doing a PhD, you cannot, you cannot, you know, put yourself through that for four years. That's just gonna, you know, burst you up eventually, like you're gonna explode and that's gonna be bad. Yep. It so, is. Yeah. I, I had the, the case of a friend, she had to took to take mm -hmm. um i think it was one month maybe a little bit more mm -hmm. just completely off yeah. like not vacation mm -hmm. no nothing just like a sabbatical take right? care yeah. of her of her mental yeah, yeah. mental health yeah. and she was she was in therapy yeah and that's i, I can imagine how yeah, how difficult that is you know but i think you need to do mm -hmm. it it's like some people just have to do it that's the only way forward yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. well i i am in therapy Okay. How is that going? Because, oh, it's great. Mm -hmm. But I mean, this therapist has been with me since I was 15 years old. Oh, wow. Okay. I mean, like, not constant, mm -hmm. but like on and off. On and off. Okay. Because when I was a teenager, um, 
I suffered a lot of anxiety mm -hmm. for exams. Mm -hmm. So he was helping me like, okay, mm -hmm. why do you get so scared? Right. Let's get to the deep, mm -hmm. you know, uh, cause of this. Mm -hmm. And then like years later, uh, well, first boyfriend broke my heart. Mm -hmm. So I was, I entered depression. Mm -hmm. So of course I called my lovely therapist. <laughs> Um, and then we stopped again once I was fine mm -hmm. and then years later, mm -hmm. so like I'm five, right when I, I had my first burnout on the PhD, mm -hmm. I called him and I was like, I don't understand what's happening. Yeah. And he said, it's fine, we'll, we'll work yeah. together. So the way he works is just doing a lot of inner healing because mm -hmm. the majority of the times when we react to something. Yeah we react like double or more yeah. exaggerated because we're experiencing a past trauma. Yeah, yeah, I can imagine. So it's, it's amazing, honestly. Mm -hmm. I'm learning so many things about myself mm -hmm. and like things that I kept yeah. that hurt within mm -hmm. me, but I didn't really realize. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, it's good. And I told him, I, I do not want a fourth burnout <laughs> on my PhD. So. I think I'm gonna stick with you until I finish my PhD, <laughs> I mean, even yeah, though I am okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I think there's you always need that one or two people in your life who you can always go back to. You know, it it can be your therapist, mm -hmm. it can be your friend, your partner, your family, and you can just talk to them and feel better, right? It's not gonna solve your your immediate issue, but it's definitely gonna give mm -hmm. you some mental space to be like, okay, you know, I can figure it out. So that's that's nice. I mean, I'm happy for you, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so going back to mm -hmm. our research topic, mm -hmm. because we're both in cancer research, mm -hmm. um, which is one of the first things that made you click follow on Instagram. <laughs> sure. <laughs> um, would you like to talk a little bit of mm -hmm. what your cancer research mm -hmm. consists of? Sure. So, uh, interestingly, I have shifted from uh, head and neck cancer research to now a more prostate cancer research based uh, focus. Mm -hmm. And that just essentially happened because uh, my previous supervisor, she had to leave the institution and I was in need of another, you know, supervisor to guide me, to mentor me for the next three years of my PhD. And I decided that I really want to stick to cancer research. So I got into prostate cancer research without actually realizing how, you know, how much more complicated it actually is because it's a hormone related cancer. And, you know, mm -hmm. as complicated as breast cancer is, prostate cancer is equally, you know, fatal and prominent in men worldwide. Like it's the leading cancer for men worldwide. And overall, like, um, I think prostate cancer research is very tough in terms of, you know, biological experiments or in terms of implementation of therapies or anything. It's equally, it's very difficult, I think. Um, it's going fine for now for me because my area of focus in research for prostate cancer is more of understanding how our circadian clock, which is like our, you know, wake up and sleep cycle, how it eventually you know influences the risk of prostate cancer and i mean it it has been studied on and off with hormone related cancers that if you know human beings if they're experiencing extreme jet lag conditions or anything that really you know messes up their circadian clock in the long run the risk of prostate cancer and breast cancer are much higher so I'm just trying to understand from more of a molecular biology perspective because that's what my lab specializes in and that's what my research is focused on right now but over the years I have realized that you know I want to shift more towards this therapeutic side like once you realize that you know this is you know the background of what prostate cancer is you want to eventually also find some therapeutic advancement for it like you want it to you know implement it in some way Otherwise, maybe your work will just be published in a paper and people will forget about it. Like, what about it? There are thousands of research papers out there, but not all of them have therapy, you know, relevance. So, they, no, yeah, not all of them have therapeutic relevance. So uh, that's what I'm trying to focus more on now. 
It's amazing. Thank you. Um, I'm, yeah, I'm just feeling really connected mm -hmm. to you right now. Mm -hmm. um, because, so we shared this story, you know, about mm -hmm. we don't want to be in diagnostics, mm -hmm. we want to be in research. Mm -hmm. And then once we're in research and we understand mm -hmm. what's happening, mm -hmm. we want to focus on the therapy, yep. right? Because yep. that is exactly what is happening to me. Mm -hmm. And that is why my Instagram, my YouTube, mm -hmm. my podcast, mm -hmm. it's not so much about the PhD project mm -hmm. or, you know, how to do a PhD, which mm -hmm. is the majority of the accounts mm -hmm. out there. Mm -hmm. I'm more focused on, okay, I'm studying cancer. Yep. So I'm going to share mm -hmm. how you can prevent mm -hmm. or some healthy habits. Yep, yep. I actually like that from your page. Tips yeah. for... Oh, thank you. <laughs> yes, I, I don't think many, yeah, so... many people are doing that out there, you know, trying to manage their PhD work, their academic life, and also maintain like a work-life balance. So that's like, that's the one good mm -hmm. thing that is novel about your account, yeah. Oh, thank you. But yeah, that's why I'm feeling so connected to you mm -hmm. um, with what you're saying. Like, do you, would you share mm -hmm. this therapy mm -hmm. um, field that you're trying to reach to mm -hmm. through your social media? Is that uh, part of your I goal? Think, or yeah. The thing is, what I like, what I put in my brain, like usually, it's from academic, mm -hmm. you know, papers. It's very academic research and jargon, and it's difficult to actually put it in, you know, let's say an Instagram reel or a short video or a short story on Instagram to share with my viewers. But on the other hand, uh, I think like what you mentioned, right, related to how you know how you manage your work-life balance and your health in the first place. You know, rather than finding a cure, you know, why not just try to do some of the prevention first? So <clears throat> for most diseases, I think we should look more to the prevention than to the cure itself. Um, prostate cancer, obviously, because it's cancer, as human beings, we would try our best to live a healthy life, right? But many cancer patients, they have lived a healthy life most of, the, of, most of their lives. Mm -hmm. Like, let's look at lung cancer, for example. Uh, Many of the lung cancer patients are not smokers. They don't drink and they catch lung cancer, not even catch, but they develop lung cancer at a very young age or, or let's say in very late, you know, uh, stage of their life. And you eventually just, you know, figure out that, okay, maybe some of it could be genetic, some of it could be environmental factors, but there's a very big part in our health as well. So uh, that plays yeah, from, from the point of view of our health and like, just strictly speaking from the, you know, the top of my head, I think drinking and smoking are one of the root causes for many cancers that we are dealing with right now. Uh, let's say heart related issues, uh, stomach cancer, head and neck cancer that I've studied, uh, liver cancer, they're all related to either sm smoking or drinking to some extent. So even if you do not have a lot of time to let's say go to the gym or maintain you know, your work-life balance, I think it's it's important to accept the fact that some things that you're consuming are going to affect your health like negatively. So that's definitely one thing that I like sharing on my page. <laughs> yeah, I've seen that. Mm -hmm. No, but that's it's really important because mm -hmm. um, there is so little. I don't know if the right word is mm -hmm. known, mm -hmm. but like. Uh, maybe little resources mm -hmm. for people mm -hmm. to know about this mm -hmm. issue, right? Yeah. Because not everyone wants to read yeah. research papers. Exactly, exactly. Um, they just need an easy way to be told this. Exactly, yeah. And others are not really ready, let's say. Mm -hmm. Some Sometimes they just don't want to know. Like, I have a friend mm -hmm. that she's like, Leave me alone. Yeah. Like, don't tell me. Don't tell me, yeah. The day that I... Yeah, she's like, the day that I get cancer, I will call you <laughs> and you will help me. But, but for now, yeah. just leave me alone. Yeah, but that doesn't <laughs> sound like, very... Okay. That doesn't sound very logical, oh, no. right? 
No, it doesn't. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, I I tell you, as long as you don't lie to yourself, mm -hmm. but if you're just deciding that this lifestyle is what mm -hmm. makes you happy and this is what you want to do, mm -hmm. like, I don't agree, mm -hmm. but I respect it, you know, like, yep. it's your life. Yep. I don't want to be, like, covering you because I'm obsessed with cancer mm -hmm. and yes. living an anti-cancer lifestyle. Mm -hmm. um, but I understand not everyone is, like, yes. caring to that point. Exactly. Um, and others do care, mm -hmm. but don't know how to acquire mm -hmm. that knowledge. I agree. So I think it's really important. That's yes. why I was asking yes. um, about the social media. Yes. Um, so since we're talking about this, mm -hmm. I was wondering, as a cancer-obsessed <laughs> scientist, mm -hmm. um, do you, do you have like any tips mm -hmm. or any habits that you say, mm -hmm. like they're your non-negotiable mm -hmm. for you? Mm -hmm. I think for me, when, you, when when I think from the health perspective, right? Um, let's say the very basic thing we all can think of is, you know, maintaining our health, let's say by going to the gym, doing yoga, uh, any other form of physical activity, a few, you know, days a week, or the other, the other, from the other perspective would be, let's say, smoking or drinking or eating certain types of food. Uh, from all those perspectives, I think it's, it's a very individual decision at the end of the day. And I think nine out of 10 people you know in your life would want to follow that lifestyle but there are different you know uh situations in which people are which you know probably stop them or you know it's not their priority at the end of the day but i think as from like from the top of my head a very big <clears throat> thing i try to avoid in my life is obviously uh not drinking and smoking like uh smoking definitely not and as far as drinking is concerned uh, it's very very occasional so those two things are definitely you know a big no-no for me um, in the in, in the other way I think yes when we talk about our health and you know in general I think maintaining our health just by you know let's say going to the gym or for me it's usually because I enjoy dancing so for me uh taking dance classes that's already a very big form of you know cardio exercise for me it helps me move my muscles and that's one thing i generally find you know more connected to instead of other activities so i think everyone just has to figure out like every individual just needs to figure out what suits their lifestyle and at the end of the day if you're forcing yourself to be you know to fit that lifestyle just for the sake of your health that's not gonna work because even physically, if you're exercising in the gym four days a week, but you're doing it because you're being forced mentally to do it. Okay, I have to go to the gym. I need to get you know over with this. It's not gonna help you because mentally you're not there. You're not connected. Your muscles and your you know your 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 brain and your muscles they're not connected. You're not gonna get anything out of it. So at the end of the day, you should follow what works for you. Yeah. And yeah. That that's just how it works it's with people yeah i couldn't agree more mm -hmm. like i get messages um from people mm -hmm. like uh can you help me create a diet mm -hmm. for me mm -hmm. um or can you help me implement your morning routine mm -hmm. to me and i'm like no <laughs> no like i can give you advices if yes. you want yes. of like what habits i mm -hmm. think are good yes or the type of diet mm -hmm. that I do, I can tell you about it. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, you need to figure out what works for you. Exactly. And like when I create my YouTube videos about mm -hmm. morning routine, healthy habits, mm -hmm. I always mention you need to behave like a scientist, right? Mm -hmm. You take these habits mm -hmm. and you experiment and test mm -hmm. them for you yep, exactly. and see if it works. Like yeah. the worst thing you can do is just copy somebody else's yeah. routine. Exactly. Just because it's, I don't know, a trend or because you admire yes. that person. Yes. I think it's great that you want mm -hmm. to work on being healthy, mm -hmm. but test it for yourself. Mm -hmm. See 
what happens, yeah. see how you feel, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, and I can put myself as an example. Mm -hmm. For so long, I was punishing myself mm -hmm. for not going to the gym, mm -hmm. yeah. you know? Like, Finola, come on, yeah. you used to go, mm -hmm. you used to enjoy it, mm -hmm. you have to be that person again. Yeah. But it has happened that I no longer enjoy it. Exactly, yeah. So it had come to a day that I say, okay, I'm gonna accept that I used to love the gym yeah. so much, mm -hmm. but now it doesn't resonate mm -hmm. with how I'm feeling. Exactly. So I changed the exercises routine. Yeah. So I think what you're saying, it's super valuable and mm -hmm. really important. Mm -hmm. And I love that you love dancing. <laughs> Thank you. Um, <laughs> I was a ballet ballerina. Oh, wow. Since I was a kid oh, wow. until yeah. I turned 18 mm -hmm. years old. And I remember when I used to do ballet, mm -hmm. um, yeah, for sure, you could feel like the cardio and mm -hmm. like the workout. And the flexibility. Also, <laughs> yes. <laughs> But also it's like, I think you you connect with your emotions, right? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. with your feelings, because you're listening mm -hmm. to the music and you're mm -hmm. expressing yourself exactly. to the music. Yep. It's yep. so beautiful. So I also think it's that not only, you know, like physical health, mm -hmm. but emotional health, yep. the Definitely. dancing. Yes, I think, yeah, it works for some people and other types of people, mm -hmm. maybe they find uh, similar feelings, let's say when they go to the gym, right? So uh, that's that's that's. I think that's what you connect with, and you would do more of that. At the end of the day, it's not to feel, you know, burdened by the fact. Okay, I have to exercise. It's the feeling that I want to exercise. You know, this is what I want to spend, let's say, the next two hours doing. So it's just easier to, you know, go to the go to, go to the dance room and dance rather than going to the gym for two hours. It just works. For you know whatever it works for you, you should be doing that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. So, what would you um, either suggest, mm -hmm. or maybe you can tell us how mm -hmm. you do it? How do you try and find a work-life balance? Because you mentioned earlier that is key. Mm -hmm. Honestly speaking, I personally don't think that there's a single PhD student that I know of who has uh, a normal work-life balance. And at the end of the day, you know, people think that a work-life balance means that every day you're gonna wake up on time, go to work, come back, cook your meal, exercise, go to sleep. That's not what a work-life balance is and I've realized it over time. It just means that on certain days, you will be doing all of that stuff. But on the other days, you will need to take out time to recover from all that stress you've put yourself on. <laughs> So that's how, what, that's really what work-life balance means. On some days you're giving 100% of your energy, on the other days you're giving 60 and the other days you might be giving 40. And that's how it's going to work out with your work-life balance. But still, I'm trying to, you know, at the end of the day, I'm trying to come up with my own understanding of what work-life balance means to me. And so far I've come to the conclusion that, you know, as long as, let's say, from a PhD perspective, because that's the only perspective I have right now. My aim at the start of the day is to, you know, finish the tasks that are ahead of me, right? In that moment, what is really important to you? You want to get done with your PhD work for the day, let's see your experiments, your writing, whatever, you get done with it. And whatever, you know, time you're left with, you try to see what you can put into it that actually makes you happy outside your work. And that is a very simple work-life balance for me. It doesn't have to be that you get up at 5 a.m., you exercise, you eat healthy food. It just has to be that, you know, you finish the day with work and then you do something that you enjoy. And that's what work-life balance is for me on weekdays, at least. It's as simple as that. There's no need to stress yourself out in the way that some people show on Instagram or social media that you have to wake up early in the morning and follow their lifestyle. It doesn't work that way for everyone else. <laughs> no. I am there with you. Yes. Like, I love waking up early. Mm -hmm. Like, I love it. Mm -hmm. I. So you're a morning person. Didn't used to. I am a morning person, mm -hmm. but I was not always. Mm -hmm. In 
college mm -hmm. and during my master, mm -hmm. I was a night owl mm -hmm. and my habits were so bad, <laughs> so bad. <laughs> it's just the journey, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. You learn about yourself exactly. and yeah. what you want to do in your life. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember when I discovered uh, this new side of myself, you mm -hmm. know, like becoming a morning person mm -hmm. and doing this uh, super great routine mm -hmm. to start the morning. And for a year, year and a half, I would always do it. I would never miss mm -hmm. it, right? And then started my PhD mm -hmm. and I had this massive roller coaster mm -hmm. <laughs> of emotions. Yep. And days came where I couldn't. Yep accomplish my routine exactly. and instead of understanding mm -hmm. I would get so mad exactly yeah. Yeah. at myself yeah. and punishing myself mm -hmm. until I reached the day just like you mentioned mm -hmm. it's all about defining what work life balance yep. means and like why are you doing these things exactly, yeah. so now I'm trying like it's still a process yeah I'm trying to learn how to listen to my body mm -hmm. so one day i will be able to get up and do my morning routine mm -hmm. and then the next day i'm maybe not able to wake up early yeah. but i can continue with the rest of the routine yeah exactly yeah. it doesn't have to be all or nothing yes and for me it's like it's what you said mm -hmm. right you define your work-life balance so for me it's very important to have me time mm -hmm. before work mm -hmm. then you work and then after work, more me time. Yep, exactly. Yeah. I, yeah, I think I think that's the thing. It's, if you're working for ten hours, you need at least half of those hours to enjoy. You know, to compensate for how much mm -hmm. you stress yourself out at work. So I think everyone just needs to figure out at, at least in the PhD, you know, uh, environment. You need to figure out as a PhD student what works for you. Right? Some people like coming to work early. Some people like to, you know, come a little bit late, but work late. And that's how they manage their life. And that's what their priorities are. So eventually you just figure out what works for you. Yeah. Absolutely. Oh, this is so wonderful. <laughs> I really love our conversation. <laughs> Thank you. And we're reaching the end. Mm -hmm. So before wrapping up, is there anything that you would like to mention? or say, I will leave all of your details in the description for people to find you. Mm -hmm, sure. But yeah, if you have anything you would like to share. Um, I actually don't have anything else specific to share other than, let's say, my experience in just PhD, you know, uh, so far, in the three years so far. Um, just like a small message, you know, for, you know, the people who will be watching this, there's a high chance that they mm -hmm. might be beginners you know, newbies in their PhD programs or research mm -hmm. programs. So I think it's eventually I just want people to know that, you know, you see yourself grow throughout this this journey. Uh, from the outside, it looks glamorous. It looks, you know, beautiful. It looks uh, very professional. But when you actually get into the journey, it's so much more difficult. It, it tests your patience. It tests, you know, how committed you are to this. And there's no, there's no doubt that you would want to give up at times. Every person goes through this, I think. But eventually it's just figuring out, you know, why you started this in the first place. There's no harm in giving up and moving on to something that works for you, honestly. But at the end of the day, mm -hmm. it's also, you know, committing to it. If you're committed to it, you will get through it as well. And that's what I always advise, you know, to people who reach out to me, you know, try to find out why you started this. And if you can't find any reason, that means, you know, it's time to leave and do something that works for you. Other than that, like, you know, academia itself and how, you know, toxic academia can be at times, that's a complete different story. <laughs> we can have another podcast on that. So, uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so other than that, I think you just, as a PhD student, I would always advise, you know, just take your mental health and, and give that a, you know, priority at some point from time to time and try to understand your emotions and work with that and you will get through PhD. That's the only message I have for people who watch mm -hmm. this, who are maybe starting their PhD or doing their PhD right now. Yeah, 
This is so valuable. Thank you. Thank you. To so all much. the listeners and the viewers mm -hmm. on YouTube, mm -hmm. like really listen to the words that she just said because it's really really valuable. Mm -hmm. The mainly the one that you mentioned, mm -hmm. your why. Mm -hmm. Look at the mm -hmm. why mm -hmm. you're doing something, mm -hmm. exactly. and just go from there. Yep. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. <laughs> So it is the end of the episode. Mm -hmm. We're going to say goodbye to our listeners and our viewers on YouTube. And I'll see you in the next episode. I would love it if you would help me spread the word by leaving a review or sharing the podcast with anyone you think might need it. Thank you so much for being here today. See you in the next one.